Welcome to Retro Warriors episode 370. Woo! As always, I'm your host, Justin Baker, and as always, I'm joined by resident old bastard, Chris Saturn. Hello. Hi, Saturn. It's, uh, um, it's been like 25 minutes. How are you doing? It, it has been. <laughs> Guy is here again, despite yes. the fact that we have no contractual obligation <laughs> for him to be here a second time in a row. <laughs> But he 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 missed uh he missed a yeah. segment, so we're gonna. And we're also, gonna... we just like having him here, so that's fine. I mean, yeah, you can say that. <laughs> you know, I'm not... <laughs> of course, we love having guy here. <laughs> he points but out how he... wrong Justin is about his childhood, and he will be here. Yeah, correcting my childhood. <laughs> that's my childhood. <laughs> anyway, um, he's gonna be here after the uh, the inning theme. Please yes. stay tuned. Indeed for that. Uh, my week. Yes, sir. I've been playing the Mech Warriors uh, four and five. Yes, and they are good. Um, yeah, I think I, you mentioned I, five a few weeks ago, didn't you? Yeah, I I I, I picked it up. Um, mm-hmm. I picked up BattleTech and all its DLC and Mech Warrior on Game Billet for like thirty bucks. Got you it. know, um, uh, like thirty thirty five bucks for all of it because I was like, well, I'm doing the BattleTech thing. I wonder if you know, because I I had I owned BattleTech on GOG. Mech Warrior, I wanted to play on my Steam Deck, and mm-hmm. getting the GOG version of BattleTech running on my Steam Deck kind of sucked, and I didn't have the DLC, so I was like, well, I'll just see if I can go buy it all for a reasonable price, and I could, so I did. Nice. Um, and I've I've been playing Mech Warrior Five and enjoying it. It's a very mm-hmm. good game, um, right. at least in its current state. No, I know when it came out, people kind of ridiculed it. I don't really know why, because even when it came out, I was like, this is good. <laughs> um, and then I went back and I've been playing Mech Warrior Four, which. It has a very different feel. Yeah, compared it's the one to, I've played the most compared to Mech Warrior Five. Um, it definitely feels more toward the like Mech Assault mm-hmm. type of thing uh, than Mech Warrior. Mech Warrior Five is very it very much. They're like, we want you to feel like you're in a giant lumbering robot. We really want you to feel that. Okay, and I don't you, know what... if you have to place it on the scale where uh, Mech Assault is a, a one and Steel mm-hmm. Battalion is a ten. Where does it fall? Well, let me ask you this. Where would you place Mech Warrior 4 on that scale? Uh, like a, a 4, a 3 or a 4. Then I'd say it's probably a 6. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's not like dramatically simulation heavy okay. or whatever. It just feels a little slower, a little more lumbering in, in a giant robot kind of way, right? Not in like gotcha. a shitty way. Right. Um, but Mech Warrior 4 just has this kind of arcadey sort of feel to it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Um, in, in, again, in a good way. Right. Um, and so now I'm kind of bouncing between Mech Warriors four and five, uh, and, and, and enjoying both of them quite a great deal. Um, I've not picked up any of the Mech Warrior five DLC. I keep kind of like, I don't know how much I'm going to stick with it cause I'm really liking Battletech right now. And I might just kind of wait till I get through more Battletech stuff and some of the DLC I bought for that before I keep going on, on Mech Warrior five. Um, but it's real good. It's it's good, and it looks good, mm-hmm. and it runs good, and I like it. Um, but I think I might be having more actual fun with Mech Warrior Four. Yeah, I do enjoy Mech Warrior Four. And I can't. I, I I have not played enough of both to really quantify why or what it is. Um, and I will say that that the the mission structure in Mech Warrior Four is pretty fun. Um, it's pretty immediate. It's pretty fast. There's kind of well-structured, fun missions. In Mech Warrior Five, there's there's something there's something missing in in its missions that feel it feels very um. I don't want to say staged. <laughs> like in Mech Warrior Four, you just play the mission and it's fun. Mech Warrior Five, you're like, okay, I'm obviously coming into the part of the mission where the reinforcements for the bad guys show up. And now I'm coming into the part of the mission where the helicopters all come and attack me for a while. It it's all very, very like rote. Yeah, everything's very mechanical, which sounds yeah. like a silly thing to say about, a game about <laughs> robots. Um, but it's just something about like the timing of the mission structures. All the parts are great, but they just kind of fit together a little, a little um, rigidly. Yeah, if that makes sense. Mech Warrior Four feels much more uh, uh, organic, I guess. That's fair, um, but I'm still playing it because. Big giant stompy robots. Right. I mean, yeah, that's the important. What part. are you gonna do? Um, my daughter was upset because she wanted to play Mech Warrior Five, and I said, "Well, you can try." <laughs> so I set her up in the biggest mech they have, yeah, which is an Atlas. And uh-huh. I and and oh, you know what? No, I was gonna put her in an Atlas, and she said, "No, I hate it." 
<laughs> and she picked a light mech, and I was like, good luck. <laughs> and I show her how to play, and she just cannot fathom the two sticks and stuff. And I put it on the easiest difficulty. She goes for a while and then blows up. And she's like, this sucks. I don't like it. I died. Right. But then Mech Warrior 4, you can just turn off heat, mm-hmm. turn on invincibility, and turn on infinite ammo in the settings. Yeah. And so I just did that. And then I put her in an atlas, and I put her in a nice. city with a bunch of mechs, and she was just going going to town. <laughs> nice um so you're um, training her to be a vt pilot someday yeah i was trying i was you know i was getting her there the other day i was playing i'm going to play the tabletop game with people i'm trying to learn it before i show up Mm -hmm. and i was playing a game of the tabletop battle tech against myself yeah and she showed up and was like can i play and i was like well sure you know uh and so she starts playing, but she assumes control of a battle mech that is already on its last leg. And I just fucking cord it out with pulse lasers immediately. <laughs> yeah, you had to teach her a lesson. She tried to run, but I had LRN 20s, and I was like, sorry, kid, sucks to be you. Um, and so she, <laughs> she, she ended up having to go to cheer practice before the actual death knell. But she yeah. was over there on the in the, in the tabletop game. Mm-hmm. You have like your little paper doll of your 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 robot, okay. And there's all these little pips in all the different armor sections. So if you're like, oh, I got hit in the left arm. In your left arm on your little paper doll, you'll have like thirty pips. So you'll mm-hmm. fill in however many pips of damage you got dealt, right? Yeah. It's and she's like filling in her damage pips, and she keeps going. Why am I filling in so many more than you? You're not filling any in. And I was like, I don't know. You only got medium lasers. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. You just it sucks to be you. <laughs> Teaching her a harsh lesson about giant robots. <laughs> well, I was trying to sell it to her. I was like, well, you know, in this scenario, I'm trying to join this clan, <laughs> and so you want me to win because you want me to join the clan. I'm not killing you. You're gonna eject and be okay. She did that, and I didn't sell it. Uh, look, man, she picked her robot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was so it's a scenario where you want to beat as you have three enemies and you're just one you have one battle mech and you fight the enemies in ascending order so the first one is the weakest and then the next mm-hmm. strongest and then the strongest one okay. and the whole thing is like how many can you defeat yeah and so she showed up when i was fighting the weakest one in this wave based scenario so yeah. you know bad timing on her part <laughs> Um, you know, and there's also, no, no way that you could have played that and let her play the other side. No, and no minimum <laughs> range on clan LRMs. So, you know, uh, that's, that's 40 missiles, <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but I had fun. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she kept crying, but you know, she'll learn, she'll get past it. Uh, you know, be all right. Be all yeah. Right. Anyway, uh, that, that's, that's been my week. Oh, oh also. Uh, I did want to say streaming mm-hmm. Steam to yeah. the Steam Deck uh-huh. still sucks, well, sucks and is busted and looks like shit. Weird. What if you do a wired connection? I'm not going to wire my Steam Deck. It's a portable. <laughs> also, I do my Steam links over Wi-Fi and they work fine. So I connected. Yeah. I, so so BattleTech mm-hmm. puts a lot of strain on my Steam Deck because it's not mm-hmm. a well-optimized game. Right. And it runs, but the whole time it's 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 about to like shoot off into space. <laughs> so I was like, well, I'll install it on my desktop and I'll stream it to my Steam Deck. Right. So I stream it and it just looks like shit. Totally garbage picture. And I was like, oh, well, it's scaling 1080p down to 800p. Maybe that's just making it look bad. Right. And so I changed the in-game resolution to 1280 by 800 and it yeah. still looks bad. And I was like, well, maybe it's having trouble scaling my monitor. So I go upstairs and I disable my secondary monitor and I change my desktop resolution to 1280 by 800 and it still looks like shit. Mm. And so I turn on FSR. I'm like, maybe I can FSR. Because FSR, when I'm playing like older games, FSR is basically incredible. magic. Yeah. It's fucking insane. Because I was playing MechWarrior 4 and I turned FSR, cranked it all the way up. It, it looks HD. It's yeah. incredible. And so I was like, well, I'll FSR. Well, here's the thing. FSR only works on resolutions that are not your native resolution right so it can't fsr it because it's already running at 1280 by 800 <laughs> yeah. and i don't know why the fuck it sucks so bad because you know, the fairness, steam link the steam link is the best streaming game streaming device that i've ever owned and it's you know technologically deprecated at this so point 
So I would like to say that lately my uh, my because I use Steam Link on my Android TV, so I don't have the dedicated device. Right, anymore. that app. Yeah. But uh, lately mine has been kind of sucking within my home, and my Steam Link and my PC are wired to the same switch. Weird. And it's been kind of sucking. So I don't know what's going on. I don't know what the hell. But it, it it's never been good on the deck. Yeah, because my my whole thing was like, well, I'm usually mostly going to play it at home, but then my really beefy games I can stream from my PC. No, right. they run like shit. They have terrible it's, lag. It's just so it does not work well. I don't know. Hopefully what they the can figure out whatever is. is causing that. I hope so, too. Everyone says Moonlight works a little bit better, but then I don't know. I try to funnel everything into Steam because obviously the Steam Deck is most com- right. convenient when using Steam stuff. Right. Um. But yeah, so I because I was trying to stream Battle Battle tech and it didn't yeah. it didn't like that whatsoever what have you been playing uh live alive which ah. is uh, good uh, i've heard of this copy and it's it's still fun and i i really appreciate how how bite-sized each little segment of the game is it makes yeah. for a great quick uh speedy jrpg uh, it's been a long time since I've played it, so I'm having to remember everything, but, uh, it's nice. It's a tactical battle system, uh, based on a grid mm-hmm. and, uh, and, uh, a lot of the chapters can be done in just a couple hours, two, three, four hours, maybe. And, uh, if I remember right, the whole game is probably like 20, 30 hours, somewhere in there. So it's a, mm-hmm. it's a pretty fast paced one, but I'm taking my time on it and, uh, and playing other things in between it. And I'm still kind of trying Horizon Zero Dawn. And I say that, but I've also put in like 30 hours. Yeah, I was going to say, you've been playing a lot of it for being really unsure. Well, I've been leaving it running a lot for being (laughs) unsure. Uh, But uh, so I'll play it in like these little bursts and then just leave it running while I'm doing other shit. Yeah. Uh, which sucks because it's uh, pause music, it's menu music is the most annoying. It's just, oh, no. it's like this like uh, uh, choral chant that's supposed to sound all, you know, ambient and yeah, atmospheric but it's just annoying enough that i hate it <laughs> that i have to mute it all the fucking time it's not the um, fun halo music kind of no it's the no annoying it's, kind of it's the we only expected you to be on this menu for a couple of moments kind of chant <laughs> but it's a menu that you constantly have to go back through because all of your menus are sub menus of that menu yeah um yeah but it's a i don't know i so like the the moment to moment gameplay of it I'm enjoying like uh, the actual exploration and finding shit. And there's a lot of shit to do. So I kind of get where people say it's similar to breath of the wild in that, in that vein. Cause it, yeah. it is a pretty big map. It's got a lot of shit to do, but that, that also describes most open world games. So but you know. how is the hunting giant robot dinosaurs? Um, I've, I've encountered several robot dinosaurs, mostly, uh, robot, uh, rams and, and robot elks. And I really robot want that horses. to be the back of the box quote. I encountered several robot dinosaurs, <laughs> Chris Saturn. <laughs> <laughs> I was, I was looking at the steam release of it cause it, it popped up on my recommended and, uh, and the very first review that it had was just robot horse. <laughs> But uh, um, yeah, no, it's 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 pretty decent. However, I noticed that my least favorite part of the game is the story. And every mm-hmm. time somebody You've been starts talking, about the story from the beginning, I hate them every time they start talking. And and it occurred to me that it like all the dialogue uh, basically feels like a, a Western RPG dialogue. Mm-hmm. And I was looking up uh, information about it online, and all these websites are listing it as. A role-playing game not as an open world action game oh. and i was like i was like did i get suckered into playing a western rpg and not oh realize that God. i'm doing they this? tricked you right? Saturn. they um, got you and i just hate every line of dialogue they are all so obnoxious and the it, it does feel uh at times like it's it's uh the the dialogue system of like a, a mass effect mixed with the uh gameplay of uh, uh a tomb raider and yeah. uh and it's a weird dichotomy there and so like as long as i'm just exploring and doing random dumb shit i'm having fun but as soon as, as i try to go back to the story to continue i'm like i hate all of this this is so bad so i don't i don't know if i'll finish it but i might still play around with it a little more i don't know i think what a lot of people cuz breath of the wild came out and reinvigorated the idea of the sandbox game right yeah. you know 
Um, and I mean, this was inevitably developed concurrently because they came out right around the same time. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I don't think Breath of the Wild had much of an influence on it. Yeah. But I think what people kind of didn't realize what was so great about Breath of the Wild is that the story basically fucked off. Yeah, yeah, it just kind of lets you do what you want to do. It's like a 60-hour game. There's like 20 minutes of cutscenes in the whole damn thing. <laughs> they it's don't like half really an hour, maybe. They don't really contribute much of right. anything. Yeah. And a lot of the story is kind of Told more emergent in that yeah. game. Yeah. And and that's what was so wonderful about it. And and that's why I, I, I we did a whole fucking episode about it. I'm yeah. sure I said it there. But right. that's what made it feel evocative of NES Zelda to right. me. What, what wasn't, you know, that it played like it. It didn't play right. anything like it. It was a totally no. different game. Yeah. But the idea of like, here's your story crawl. Now you just go do it. Right. Bye. See yeah. you later. <laughs> yeah. You know. Um, yeah. And I thought that it was going to be similar once I got out of the tutorial area in Horizon. That it was right. just going to like let me go wild. But no, there's still just indicators everywhere. And, and the, you know, the, I think last time I was complaining about how often it wants you to go into detective vision mode. And yeah, I works. thought that it was going to be like, well, that's the tutorial. They're teaching you how to do it. Right. And and you can choose if you want to use it later or not. No, like every story mission is this is the lady that has detective vision. Go ask her. <laughs> and like everything revolves around it. And then I have to sit there and watch two characters monologue at each other about it for 10 minutes. That's just uh, just. Uh. Unlike those JRPGs where characters never monologue at nope. each other. No, nope. because nope. there's always a third person in the conversation because you oh, have a party. There's no monologuing right. when there's multiple people. <laughs> uh, let's do the news. Yes, sir. First up, former Aleste developers announce Gunstream, a new shmup for the Game Gear. Did you see the video of it, though? No, does it look good? It looks amazing. I <laughs> I wish I had seen Game Gear games that looked like this back when the Game Gear was still around. Because man, it looks nice. the The problem with the Game Gear uh, is that there's just a not a lot Gear. of really good games on it. True, um, there are some good games on the Game Gear. Don't get me wrong. Yes, I just there, don't like. There's the, the Golden uh, Axe RPG, and and there's uh, uh, whatever else you can get in in your eight minutes of battery life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but uh, but no, it looks really impressive. I will definitely play it in an emulator because uh, yeah, G Lock Air Battle. To, I do not want to play on an actual Game Gear. Yeah, uh, Tencent and Logitech. Tencent and Logitech. Okay, mm. are working on a dedicated cloud streaming handheld. Yeah, that will never function in my home. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, Tencent and Logitech. Yeah, that's uh, we knew it was coming. They said it'll support uh, Stadia and X Cloud. And uh, GeForce Now. Is this the thing that that no, that was a different thing. Mm. I was gonna say, is this the thing that um, the news article came out and was like, this is the closest we'll ever get to the Vita two? <laughs> no. And it was it was like a no, that was a streaming thing. No, that was a, a an iPhone grip for uh, PlayStation Remote Play. Oh yeah, what a what a bad way to hide the fact that your article is literally an ad for this hardware controller. Yeah, you know. Uh, Fan-made remake of Sonic Triple Trouble in the style of 16-bit Sonic games is now available. And it looks good, too. It does look good. Yeah. I need, uh, to, I need to actually download it and try it instead of just saying that it looks good. I should no, you know, no. spend just the five stuff minutes looks to play good. it. Oh, right. My bad. It's right, fine. Let's go. You got more monologues to go watch. <laughs> SNK and Capcom announced the Neo Geo Pocket Color game Mega Man Battle and Fighters will be releasing in the West for the first time as a download for Switch. That's exciting to me. I love all the Neo Geo Pocket Color releases right? and love that has been happening. It's yeah. great. It's a great system that is oddly difficult to emulate. Is it? Actually hmm. requires a decent amount of horsepower for what it is. I mean, like any any regular PC can do it, but right. like um, like a Pi Zero cannot emulate hmm. NGPC. It just lags all the shit. Wow. You know, a, a lot of lower end hardware, a lot of these like smaller Android handhelds and stuff like they, it's 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 you, it's a struggle. You think the Series X would handle it? I don't know. Is it is it any good? Is it? I hear it's pretty it good. Seems, how many just, polygons can it do? Like, That's how uh, they used to rate this shit, right? More than one. How many bit is it, Saturn? Uh, I think it's a uh, um, eleven teen bits. I'm gonna need you to do the math yeah. because Atari <laughs> taught me that that's the only way to know which game right. system is superior. That's how you end up with a 3DO. 
Tactics Ogre Reborn finally officially announced for release on PlayStation 4 and 5, Switch, and Steam on November 11th. Yep. Which is really soon. Oh, yeah. Based on the PSP game, but rolls back some changes to the Super Famicom version. I'm um, I'm I'm stoked on this. I'm stoked that it's coming to Steam, which means I can play it on, on deck. Yep. Um, I'm just very excited. It, what a good game. Yeah. What a good game! Oh yeah, and oh, I'm a I little, wait. I'm a little concerned about some of the the rollbacks and the, okay. the design. Like what? But like because uh, I've I've not looked into it. I want to, you know, I've so I know definitively that uh, the characters no longer have a TP gauge anymore, uh, just okay. like on the Super NES. Okay, um, and that was also how they did the, their specials, wasn't it? Right, but they didn't use that in the original. Okay, um, and uh, and also uh, if I remember. Somebody was saying they they uh, saw that uh, the cards weren't there. That's just the regular stat ups, like on the Super NES version. Mm-hmm. So, um, but most of the game is going to be the same. Well, see, now I'm like, maybe I should just play the PSP version <laughs> on my deck. <laughs> we'll see. I guess we'll see. Uh, RPCS three update adds save states, which is not a thing that it has had. In, so that's exciting in... for PS three games with save states. That's that's yeah. a lot of RAM to save. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, I I do kind of wonder how big the save states are going to be. Like right. I wonder I wonder if that was some of the issue was getting them down to a reasonable size. Yeah, I'm trying to remember how much RAM the PS3 had. I want to say it was like 256 megs, 512 megs, somewhere around there. Yeah. Uh, a new Bomberman title is announced by Konami as a rhythm game that will be an Apple Arcade exclusive. I made sure to phrase that one in such a way that each word got worse. It's. <laughs> It, it, it is the rest of the sentence and we'll have nfts so i just don't know how it gets <laughs> yeah i um what is konami doing with that uh, okay like I, I like rhythm games and i like bomberman yeah i don't know that i ever asked for the fucking two of them to iphone saturn oh right my bad <laughs> i i i uh, okay whatever yeah uh tencent is looking to purchase a larger share of ubisoft Fucking mm. good. Take them. We don't want them. <laughs> yeah. You uh, have them. Yeah. It looks like they want to become a, a commanding owner of Ubisoft. Which oh, is that what know. it's called now? Commanding owner? I didn't know that commanding was the, ownership. I didn't, I didn't know that was the, the terminology. That I don't sounds know. sounds like, like a naval. <laughs> yes, I have commanding ownership of this battleship. <laughs> uh, GameStop's NFT marketplace was caught selling unauthorized copies of indie games. What? Not GameStop's no. very ethical and fun NFT marketplace. <sighs> yeah, and when the uh, when the dude who was selling them was asked about it, uh, his response was, "But I wanted to make sure that people had a chance to play these games from their own wallet." What? Despite the fact that they could have already played those games elsewhere. Without you know paying for them first, yeah. Uh, or maybe if they did want to pay them, they could have paid the people who actually made the games. I, I, I but uh, uh, hmm. but no, it's important that you play it in the blockchain because that somehow makes your free game better because you paid for it. If I had one wish, mm-hmm. in if one video game wish, mm-hmm. it would be for GameStop to die a catastrophic <laughs> and fiery death that we could all watch. <laughs> My and favorite- I wanted to take a real long time so we can all really enjoy it. And I my, want it to be really embarrassing for all the executives. And my, my favorite part was, uh, cause I saw this in uh, PC gamers article about this story. The, the very first sentence in their article is sclerotic Funko pop retailer GameStop <laughs> continues. It's ill-advised NFT marketplace pivot despite a string of embarrassments. Funko Pop retailer. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Uh-huh. I went to a place. Total tangent. I I went to a place in the mall, mm-hmm. and I thought it was like just like a nerd tchotchke store, like a think right, geek. Right. You know, yeah, back yeah. before GameStop fucking killed them. Yes. Um. And I go in, and it's not. It is an antique mall that sells geeky stuff. So it's all these different little mm. stalls, and it's all like you know nerdy stuff. It's anime yeah. and miniatures. Sure. But then literally. I'm not kidding. 85% of everything in there was walls of Funko Pops. Gross. Huge walls of Funko Ugh. Pops. Every stall had at least one. Some of them were entirely floor to ceiling mm. Funko Pops with fluorescent lighting. Every Funko Pop is in its own little acrylic case. Oof. And I'm like, who the fuck is buying these? 
There know. are so oh. many for sale that inevitably, that means not as many people are buying them, right? That's got to be what that means. My mother has started buying them. Uh, but like, there's so many that she would have to, everyone that likes Funko Pops would have to be <laughs> buying like a hundred of them. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't understand what the, I don't understand the draw in the first place. I certainly don't understand why there is enough demand for how many there are. I understand being like, oh, I really love Godzilla. If there's like a little Godzilla Funko Pop, cool, I'd buy that and stick it on mm. my shelf. It'd be a cute little thing, you know. But then I don't understand. If you collect Funko Pops out there, please join our Discord <laughs> and talk to me about it because I don't there's, fucking get it. There's a, a guy uh, that he's not in my office, but he's through uh, my company uh, yeah. who informed us that he just collected his, uh, I think he said second or third complete series of The Office Funko Pops. <laughs> Is is it is that it? Is you want to get the whole series? I just I assumed there was some crazy resale value thing where know. people are buying them and flipping them. You know, it's a Beanie Baby thing. Yeah, he he showed us all of his The Office Funko Pops. All right then. Yeah. I the only Funko I I own three four Funko Pops. I own zero. One was given to me as a gift, and three came in my Batman animated series box set. <laughs> <laughs> they were tiny little baby ones. Now I don't own any Funko Pops, but there are some Nendoroids I've looked at and uh, almost pulled the trigger. Right, on one or two. Yeah, but again, they're, they're there's so many Funko Pops out there. Everyone that yeah. likes Funko Pops would have to buy 500 of them. <laughs> uh, and finally, <laughs> finally. Now that we're done talking about sclerotic Funko Pop retailer GameStop. <laughs> Square Enix told investors they sold IDOS because they were worried it was cannibalizing sales from their other games. Because, yeah. you know, you know how people are. They're like, look, do I want to get the new Deus Ex game or do I want to get Kingdom Hearts? They're so fucking similar. Do yeah, I want Tomb Raider? Do they, I want Final Fantasy? They're so fucking similar that I just, I don't know. They, apparently they said something along the lines, uh, and this is obviously paraphrased, but they were saying that, that Tomb Raider was sucking all the oxygen out of the room because it was so big that it was not that, allowing all of their other franchises room to breathe. I feel like it's rare that I feel like I need to tell a business how making money works, <laughs> <laughs> you know, where I need to be the one like, hey, man, you're kind of leaving money on the table. Like, yeah. it is very rare. Usually it's reserved for Nintendo. Mm -hmm. But for them to be like, it was so big and successful <laughs> that we just had to get rid of it. Like, what are they fucking Kurt Cobain? Like, <laughs> just what are you doing? <laughs> It's just, you know, uh, Mr. Square Enix was like, you know, this Tomb Raider is really just doing so well that I can't sell any of these Arkanoids. <laughs> it's uh, fucking it's, morons. It's let's talk, about the, let's talk about the topic at hand. This week we're talking Keiji Inafune. <laughs> fucking morons. Let's talk about <laughs> Keiji Inafune. <laughs> Who's not a fucking moron. Um... I do have some problems with him, but we'll get into it. You may know him as the sole and only creator of Mega Man, who never yeah. did anything else, and no yeah, one helped him it. make Mega Man ever. <laughs> it's all him. Yeah. Sh it's a whole cloth out of his head. And you should remember him for that, because he never did anything after that. The <laughs> end. Definitely nothing. Yeah. Uh, he was born May 8th, 1965, in Kishiwada, Osaka, Japan. Mm-hmm. As far as first encounters, I, I, my, I've said it on the show before. My first Mega Man was Mega Man X. Yeah. So I so was pretty youngin'. late to the Mega Man party. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's I like had, 10 games in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I had heard Inafune's name thrown around in the early aughts, like kind of next to names like Miyamoto and Igarashi right. and other big designers. Mm -hmm. um, he was just kind of in that pool of like notable, you know, Japanese game designers. Right. Um, and he was just always treated and referred to as the guy that made Mega Man. Yeah, the Mega Man guy. Um, which is kind of weird. We'll yeah. get into why. Yeah. But but uh, it, that's how I always knew him as. Yeah, see, I, uh, I feel like he is a name that I didn't learn until the last 10 or maybe 15 years. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, back in the day, the only time you ever heard a name of a developer was if it was in a magazine and Nintendo power EGM or somebody. And they didn't right. go into too much depth about a lot of the developers. They, you know, Miyamoto would get attention cause he's Miyamoto. Um, here, Nobu Sakaguchi would usually get some attention just because of Final mm -hmm. Fantasy. You see um, Kojima because he couldn't resist. Yep, exactly. Hideo Kojima could, literally could not keep his name out of magazines, <laughs> yep. um, which is fine because he certainly didn't try. Um, and, and so, you know, there were a handful of names you would see. 
But for the most part, it was just, oh, that company makes that game. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so I never knew who made Mega Man. And by the time that I did hear about any name associated with Mega Man, it was Inafune. And it was kind of in the arrow that he was starting to leave Capcom or at least, you know, wind down his his direct uh, development uh, on any game. So so it is weird that that's when I suddenly started hearing about him and hearing about him a lot. And then, uh, of course, he didn't become notorious until after he was no longer. Yeah. Well, uh, tell me about his time at Capcom, because I feel like that is definitely the most celebrated portion. Right. Of his career. Yeah, so he, he started at Capcom right out of college in 87 as an illustrator. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was an interview with Kotaku where he had mentioned that he had intended on working at Konami. But he uh, was talking with his professor at college. And uh, he had told his professor, I, I want to apply to work at Konami. And his professor said, no, you should apply at Capcom. They're closer. <laughs> I do love the idea of like an alternate universe, Inafune, Konami thing. yeah. You know, like, how would Capcom have done without his influence on Mega Man? Kid Dracula would have been a much bigger series. And how would Konami have done with him there? Right. You know, because Konami was always like, it was like you had Capcom and Konami, and Capcom was cute. Yeah. And well, did Street no, Fighter. Not always. You had, you know, Street Fighter. You had uh, uh, Commando and, and stuff like that. Right. But then Mega Man was cute. There was enough Mega cute was Mega Man. Cute. Yeah. But then Konami was like the dark one. It was like, oh, well, they do the Dracula games. Yeah, and Contra. And Contra, which was definitely darker. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I was just thinking about, like, like w- the, the alternate universe where he joined <laughs> Konami instead. You know, it's what would still Capcom funny to me that, like? you know, he only applied because it was closer. Well, you know, uh, commute's a real thing, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Long commute, that sucks. But it's like a, <laughs> a drastic change in your career path. It's like, oh, this one's closer, though. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, uh, anyway. But yeah, so uh, his first projects at Capcom were uh, the first Street Fighter, where he did uh, character portraits, uh, mm-hmm. as well as uh, so Mega we, Man. It's his fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Those portraits were rough, man. <laughs> Those were rough. I... I can't. I I can just barely see one of those portraits, and I will immediately think of the voice act over for from it. I mean, really, Street Fighter portraits were rough for a while. <laughs> yeah, at least even, until Super Turbo or yeah, until Super even, Street Fighter Two. Even in early Street Fighter Two, it was like, what the fuck is wrong with their face? <laughs> like, also Chun Li's Bl- outfit is wrong in her portrait. Blanca a, would grow a, a fucking color. hunchback for some reason. Yeah, that's why, true. Why does he have a hunchback? Did you kick him so hard in the chest that you gave him a hunchback? <laughs> <laughs> Makes no sense. Yeah, it was uh, it was a little weird. I don't it know was, if he did the strange. the portraits in Street Fighter Two or not. I know he did the first one. Huh. But uh, but yeah. So uh, he did uh do the first Mega Man as well. It was other uh, among the first two projects he did. Um, and despite what the internet has led everyone to believe. Kaiji Inafune is not the father of Mega Man nor the creator of what? Mega Man. I know. Oh my god! I know. Oh, well, I've been lied to. <laughs> Pablo, can you add in shocked gasps, <laughs> please? And, and and also edit in the audio of a monocle dropping from someone's eye. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like tink. <laughs> Oh, mom. <laughs> That's my rich guy outrage noise. <laughs> oh, I've been, I've, I've been workshopping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, keep workshopping that one. So if Inafuna had joined Konami, mm-hmm. Mega Man still would have existed. Correct. All right. Tell yes. me more. Yeah. So uh, in the first game, Inafuna contributed some of the enemy character designs. He also designed Elect Command uh-huh. as the only robot master from the first game that he is credited with having mm-hmm. created. Uh, he and also this, what's that seems to be just a rip off of a Spider-Man villain kind of. Yes. Um, <laughs> so he uh, he also uh, did the box art for uh, Rockman in Japan. Uh, that was in Japan. Yes. In Japan. Well, yeah. The, the, the Western box art is not <laughs> not the same. I feel like if he did the Street Fighter one portraits <laughs> and then the Western <laughs> box art for Mega Man, they'd be like, we got to let you go, man. <laughs> right. We, yeah. This is not working out. We don't this know what you end. think Sorry. art is. <laughs> this is not it. I don't know what school you went to, but you need to ask for your money back. 
I imagine yeah. they get, like kick in his office door to fire him. And they're like, who the fuck thinks human beings look like this? And he turns around looking like one of those Street Fighter 1 portraits, you know? And they're like, oh, we're so sorry. He's like, we didn't know. <laughs> he just turns around and goes, oh, 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 oh. So yeah, he uh, the the director of the original game, uh, who is Akira Kitamura, was uh, the creator of the original Rockman pixel art, and and he was the actual creator and designer of Mega Man, and yes. uh, and Inafune was just told make the box art from this pixel art, and Inafune refers to that as reverse character design. Is Let me... how he reverse character designed Mega Man. He's the reverse father <laughs> of Mega Man. This just feels like a cop-out way for him to claim <laughs> credit for something he didn't make. Kind of. That, that, that's, like, that's like if I made an abstract drawing of the Terminator and say <laughs> that I reverse-designed the Terminator. <laughs> that's not how it fucking works, buddy. Someone Wait. made a game and they needed a box. You did not reverse character design shit. Hold on. Are you telling me that you're the reverse designer of the Terminator? <laughs> yeah, I'm the reverse Terminator designer. <laughs> Amazing. I feel like a reverse Terminator would just help you with your chores and stuff. Like, you do the opposite of what a Terminator does. Yeah, the reverse Terminator is not looking for this woman. <laughs> yeah, he, it's the only woman he doesn't want to find. He's like, I do not want to find Sarah Connor. Anyone else is fine. I think that's inverse Terminator. Oh, right. My bad. <laughs> the reverse Terminator is looking to unfind Sarah Connor. Yeah, he's found her and he wants, he wants her to go away. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's actually Terminator 2. Fuck. Um anyway. But but <laughs> this is the the goofiest. Now here's the thing. Uh-huh. If he did the box art yeah. and then in the second game they made mm-hmm. Mega Man Sprite look like the Mega Man 1 box art, uh-huh. then you could be like, "Okay, yeah, they had it already designed. They already had to put it in the game that way, but then when they saw my version, they said, "Oh, we need to make it look more like that. It's the same fucking sprite." Yeah, they reused the same sprite for six games. Plus the so game games. So he didn't fucking reverse. Just it makes no sense. Yeah, and then uh, and then if you look at the uh, later games like uh, Mega Man Seven and Eight, mm-hmm. um, that I mean I think Inafune did the design for those, but they don't yeah. look like his box art from the original games. So, you know. No, no. So I I don't really know. And what's weird is he seems pretty open about the fact that Akira Kitamura actually made Mega Man. Yeah. He's like, no, yeah, no, no. That's the dude that made that. Mega Man. But then in this interview, he's like, well, I reverse character designed Mega Man. <laughs> this is my reverse you know, character design. Right. So, you know. <laughs> I, it's, just, it's just as weird. It's yeah. Just, I don't it's, know. It's strange. Anyway. Um, but, but starting with the second game, uh, he did do more of the art. But also starting with the second game is when Capcom started holding contests in Japan to have people submit ideas for the Robot Masters. And then uh, uh, Inafune would just take that that art that was submitted and turn it into Mega Man style art. So yet again, Mm -hmm. he is designing nothing. (laughs) He's just reverse character designing some child's art. Not all of the characters were from the contest. I think some of the characters were designed in house. I don't know which ones, but if you look at the ending credits for each one, it'll tell you who designed the characters. And a lot of them are submissions. So what what is I'm, I'm having an office space moment of just like what exactly is it would you say <laughs> you do here yeah so, Fune? yeah well, what is it exactly because uh-huh. i can't tell yeah so and he had told uh games radar that his goal back then was to make the robot masters uh that that he was designing look like characters from western style comic books uh specifically referencing oh, spider-man and x-men um again kind of spelling out exactly how that much electro why I like, like man, electro. electro so so i'm just imagining him like well, i take the character designs from the submission department to the art department they're not people persons <laughs> <laughs> yeah as um, kg and afune's jump to conclusions man <laughs> 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 Um, I want to I want to talk about some of these contests. Um, I don't want to talk about yeah. the ones that he handled um, right. I, because I, the, one of them, I believe this is the first one to run in the West. Yeah, it was for Mega Man 6. <laughs> in Nintendo Power issue 44, mm-hmm. they ran one. The, the, they had they showed submissions in yeah, the magazine. They were the ones who collected the submissions to send to Capcom for Mega Man 6. <laughs> and I read through some of these. 
and they're fucking hilarious. And I want to give you some of the greatest hits. First of all, Sun Man by Mark Lopez in Pinedale, California, who is holding the entire fucking sun. Really, he looks like Pharaoh Man from Mega Man 4. It, well, his weapon looks like Pharaoh Man. His face looks like, uh, I don't know, a fry kid from McDonald's. A, a fry kid. Nobody fucking knows what a fry kid is anymore. <laughs> But the idea of him, like, what's your weapon? Oh, I throw the entire fucking sun at you. Oh, so the entire planet is immediately destroyed? Yes. <laughs> what's yes, a miniature that's my sun? power. It's a miniature sun. Uh, we have Yo-Yo Man. Yeah. Uh, no, that says Yo-Yo Ma in. <laughs> no, it says Yo-Yo Man <laughs> by old Andy Adams. This one is my fucking favorite. Yeah, that one looks Clone... the most Mega Man-y. Clone Man is just red Mega Man, <laughs> but real fugly looking. No, that's like pink Mega Man. He's like the color of a, a of an eraser. He's like a salmon, like yeah. a salmon Mega Man. Yeah. And <laughs> um, then you have Optic Man, who's just an eyeball. Yeah. Yeah. I don't yeah. know what his power is. Well, he looks at you. Uh, this is. <laughs> I, 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 I don't understand. Yeah. You have Slice Man, which is just the Wolverine. <laughs> it's just Wolverine. He's even wearing a yellow jumpsuit and a gimp mask. Yeah. Like, it's true. It's just fucking like Wolverine. Wolverine. Wolverine's always wearing a gimp To mask. his right is Blade Man, who is also just Wolverine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a popular character at the time. <laughs> There's two that are kind of racist, so I can't even yeah, talk about them. Can't talk about those. And then you have. This one that is so... It makes no sense. <laughs> and they published it in the fucking magazine. <laughs> Weaseletta and Terror Teddy. Which, in this thing's defense, is probably the most Mega Man looking of any of these. Like, that looks like a, an enemy sprite that would be in the game. It's just the weird... It's a little... It's a giant... Bear. Patchy yeah. teddy bear with an angry face holding a, a girl. tiny girl? Yeah. I don't, I don't understand. So, so, uh, just as some, some context here, I was so excited about this contest. Now, I didn't submit anything because I have no artistic ability, but yeah. when they published this issue that had all the, the submissions, I was like, oh man, imagine what that would be like in the game. And I was so yes. excited about all of these. And for people who don't know about this contest, it was for Mega Man 6. And, um, and then Capcom picked the winners and they, they put them in the game and then they had no intentions of releasing Mega Man six outside of Japan. So, <laughs> so the, the so people, people outside of J Japan couldn't get to fight Weaseletta and Terra Teddy at right. all. So, and then, uh, Nintendo, uh, and their infinite wisdom were like, guys, we ran a, a, a contest in our magazine for the characters in this game. It has to come out in america so they published it in america and no one published it in europe so yeah you know it was a, a weird time the best part is right next to derpy looking clone man is, yeah. a, is a picture of dr wiley being like i'll use these new <laughs> robot masters to stop mega man and right next to him is clone man like who's me clone man <laughs> just like looking goofy yeah and for the record none of the ones printed in the magazine were used in the game <laughs> those were all runners up um let's move on yeah yeah, yeah. so um uh, inafune had told uh, nintendo power that Mega Man 3 was his least favorite in the original series due to corporate stress and deadlines and he uh insists that the game should have been much much better mm -hmm. which uh i think is hard to to imagine because uh, that's one of my favorite games in the series I yeah. thought it was excellent. So I was surprised yeah. to see that he was so critical of it. Uh, but that was the game where he started taking on roles other than just illustrator. He started working with production in the game and he had more creative control on the actual series. Um, and he continued to have more creative control as the series went on. He became a series director, series producer. The yeah. first original protagonist character that he created for the series was zero in Mega Man X Mm -hmm. which he had intended to be Mega Man for the X series. Um, and, uh, and you know, after he had designed the character, uh, he realized that people probably wouldn't want that drastically different of a character for Mega Man. So yeah. he went to another staff designer and said, hey, could you actually just remake Mega Man that fits this art style? 
Yeah, could and, you draw actually Mega Man? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Because apparently I can't create a character called Mega Man. I don't have that ability in me. <laughs> I need someone else to do this. I'll just take credit later. It's fine. Yeah, it's great. Um, don't worry about it. <laughs> so so he made Zero, but he did not make X. Um, but still, Zero is a badass character. You can't, yeah. can't fault that. Yeah. Um, he did step down for his, from his role as lead illustrator during production of Mega Man 7, though he did still help contribute character designs. And, uh, and he became the series producer during Mega Man 8. And uh, as producer, he continued uh, the Mega Man and the Mega Man X series, and he introduced Mega Man Legends as well as the Battle mm-hmm. Network series. Mm-hmm. He had actually famously intended to end the series, uh, the X series at Mega Man X5, and told the team to wrap it up. And, uh, and then he thought they were done, and then somebody at Capcom Management was like, no, you're not. And, uh, and they got You to, think we're only going to make five of a Mega Man game? Right? Are you insane? Yeah. So they had to, you know, go right back into that. Um, and then uh, after he had worked with uh, NT Creates on Mega Man ZX, uh, he uh, worked with them again to make Mega Man 9 and 10 as the reboot of the classic franchise. So mm-hmm. uh, he, he was involved with all of that. And uh, in May of 07, he had expressed interest in a new uh, Mega Man Legends game. Um, and after there was all the positive feedback, it was officially formally announced in October of 2010, Mega Man Legends 3. And uh, he had asked fans to uh, submit concepts and artwork for the game. And they got just a ton on their web portal that they had set up entirely to receive submissions. And then they announced there was a demo coming out uh, right before they decided to cancel the game in the demo in <laughs> July of 2011. This was such a weird era for Mega Man. It really was. It just everything went to shit. Yeah, because well, then... you suddenly had Mega Man 9 and 10, which were yeah. great. And then Mega Man Legends 3 was announced, which I guess, cool. Uh, so there were people very excited about it. And yep. then it it just seemed to implode on itself almost instantly. Well, and then like a couple years later, they showed off, what was that, Mega Man Universe or whatever? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it, it it demoed really poorly. Yeah. And then they just shit canned that. And then it was like, is Mega Man dead for a while? That's two big Mega Man games yeah. canceled. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a, a difficult era to be a Mega Man fan. Yeah. But well, they did uh, release Street Fighter Cross Mega Man during that time. Yes, they did. That had the uh, box art. Uh, 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 no, yeah, I was thinking of um, Street Fighter Cross Tekken that had box oh, art and yeah, Mega Man no, in it. That was different. Yeah. Um, it, yeah this, this was kind of the beginning of, of them really being big into like fan projects and stuff yeah. and really endorsing those. Right. I think because they had no idea what the fuck to do with Mega Man at, at, at this point. And uh, obviously the answer we learned eventually was just fucking make Mega Man 11 already, please. Right. And now um, if they would just make a, another Mega Man X, that would be great. It would be fantastic. I would love to see a Mega Man X in the the tone of Mega Man's 9 and 10, kind of back to roots, 2D, Mega Man X, you know? Yeah, either that or in the, the vein of Mega Man 11, where it is still traditional gameplay, but modern uh, uh, presentation. Yeah, totally would be fine. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the non-Mega Man things that he apparently did. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, he did uh, end up doing a lot of other stuff at Capcom, obviously. Uh, he was uh, uh, the promotion producer for Resident Evil 2. And as he worked on Resident Evil 2 is when uh, the people at Capcom were like, oh, you can sell stuff. You are you are not just the Mega Man Illustrator guy. Mm-hmm. And so he you know, got more tasks and Pardon more Pardon me, uh, Mega Man reversed character I'm designer. Sorry. The reverse I think, character I designer. Is, I think is what you meant to say there. The inverse Terminator guy. Um <laughs> So he uh, did take on other work. He uh, was the creator of the Onimusha series. Um, See, I feel like that should be the feather in his cap. Right? Like, yeah, but, you worked on Mega Man, and, and I, I know Onimusha's not big now, but Onimusha right. was big for a while there. Yeah, yeah. Like, During that was those a like, big five deal, years man. that it was big, it was huge. And they were very celebrated games. People fucking love the Onimusha games. And then they re-released the first one a couple of years ago, and no one bought it. <laughs> nope. No one. But it's it's just weird to me that it's like if he did create the Onimusha series, like yeah. I would be propping that up rather than yeah. saying I reverse designed Mega Man. <laughs> I'd be like, I fucking made Onimusha. That's like that's, there's like five games in that series. Three. There's three games. And well, you got tactics. the three main games and then tactics. I thought there was another one. Maybe I'm just I thought imagining it was just those that. Four. Yeah. Yeah. But Genre No was in that one. Yeah. 
So I, I, I like that. That's that's a big that's a big claim, right? To have created the Onimusha series. Yeah, and and after that, he was uh, uh, promoted to senior corporate officer at Capcom, which that's a hell of a title. Um, yeah. And and he he at that time oversaw production on a bunch of games, uh, things like Dead Rising, uh, as well as uh, he, he was responsible for green lighting games like Bionic Commandos reboot, Lost Planet, oh, no. Dark Void. Um, and oh, famously, no. that's uh, what happened. Yep. Famously, <laughs> he was very critical of Japanese game development during that era, and to this day, he is still very critical. I, of I remember game that. Mm -hmm. People were fucking pissed. Well, yeah. This is one of the, the premier names of one of the premier Japanese publishers coming out and saying, well, Japanese developers suck. Yeah. And yeah. to be fair, and I, I I don't know if it was translation issues or what, the way he said it came across really harsh. Yeah. But the intent of what he said, I think, you know, I think there was something there. Something yeah, there meaningful is, there. Right? there. There is some merit to the fact that Japanese game development was a little behind Western development at that time. Because they were still trying to refine these these PS1 era principles. Whereas yeah. Western development had gone hard into mostly first person shooters and Western RPGs. Mm. Uh, and open world games. Um, so there was something to be said for that. Um, uh, he... One of the quotes uh, specifically was him saying that Japanese people should feel embarrassed of Japanese game development at the time. And that was the one that really seemed to hit hard for a lot of people. Yeah. And uh, and uh, he also uh, spent that time commissioning a lot of games and sequels and spinoffs developed by Western studios. That seemed to be his thing for a while there when he mm -hmm. was mostly in charge of, of things at Capcom. Um, and also after uh, Street Fighter EX3, which he was not particularly involved in, uh, did so poorly, they kind of just shit canned the Street Fighter series for a while there in the early yes. 2000s. Yes. And then Street Fighter 2 Turbo came out on Xbox Live Arcade and did really, really well. And so Inafune approved production on Street Fighter 4. He was the person who, when the Street Fighter team went to Capcom management and they were like, we want to make a new Street Fighter Apparently, he was the one who was like, who championed them and said, yes, yeah. we should do this. Uh, I, I want to make sure that you have the ability to do it. So that's. I mean, Onomusha is a big deal. Mm -hmm. uh, Dead Rising was a huge deal. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, uh, Lost Planet, I feel, is kind of underrated. I feel like Lost Planet is underrated. I, I only played the first one, but that's a really good game. Hmm. Um, I don't, And they made three of them. Yeah, the Bionic Commando reboot did what it did. Yeah. And the best thing that came out of Dark Void was the DSiWare 2D game, which right. was a blast. Yeah. Which um, I believe was also into creates, wasn't it? I think so. I want to say it was, but it has been years. Yeah. But then between those and 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 pushing for Street Fighter 4, like these are a lot of major home runs. Yeah. On top of the, you know, some not so great things. Right. But this was, you know, yeah, this was also the era when uh, Resident Evil 5 and 6 were coming out, which were yep. Capcom's highest selling games of all time when they were yep. coming out. And when compared to those, seeing these other projects for Capcom management was like, well, these are good, but they aren't as good as some of I these guess, other things. I guess what's frustrating is this this whole era, like early aughts through like uh, uh, 2010 mm -hmm. feels like what should be considered the height of Inafune's career. Right. You know, he's pushing out Onomushi, he's pushing out Dead Rising, he's pushing out Lost Planet, he's fighting yep. for Street Fighter 4. Like, these these are major th things. Yeah. But then it's just, it, you're right, it's just kind of ignored because Resident Evil 5 sucks, but man, it fucking sold good. Because yep. the, the stuff that he had worked on prior to that, Mega Man, uh, is incredibly well beloved uh, over the years. Yep. And uh, despite the fact that those games did pretty well during their time they don't have that same uh, nostalgia for a lot of people. Yeah. So, so I, I, I don't know. I guess it's just weird that he's so remembered for Mega Man and these are major home runs. And, oh, yeah. and it, it also makes me kind of, kind of, uh, I, I don't know. I guess I get him feeling exasperated and frustrated with, with Japanese game companies and game design because he's over here pumping out a lot of really great stuff. Right. But then what doesn't make sense is Resident Evil 5, you know, definitely the most westernized Resident Evil to right. date at the time. Yeah. You know, that is what Capcom's doing. 
and right. it is selling gangbusters. I don't know. Yeah, and and also how many Western games of that era were influenced heavily by Resident Evil Four, which is a Japanese True. developed game. True. Most so, definitely. You know, there's uh, it's there's some give and take there. Yeah. But uh, um, after all that, he was uh, promoted to global head of production at Capcom in April of 2010. So they, well, they clearly... these job titles sound like they're out of the movie Brazil. Right. Like senior corporate <laughs> officer. Like what is <laughs> that's? I've worked so many places with senior corporate officers. That's what the fuck a is a corporate thing. officer? That's what does that even who mean? Represents corporate. Well, where? To the company. in public. Wait, is it, what? Isn't that a marketing person? No, because sometimes you also have to represent corporate two divisions of your own company. Isn't that just HR? No, HR represents the the employees. It's internal corporate marketing people? Kind of. Like it's uh, somebody from corporate who goes to different divisions and is like, no, this is what corporate's going to do and we don't care about what you're saying right now. I would rather buy an NFT than hear any more <laughs> about this. <laughs> So yeah, he was promoted horrible. to global head of production in April 2010, uh, only to uh, six months later announce that he was leaving Capcom. Yes. So he uh, uh, something internally was not going right there, and he was not mm-hmm. happy with it. So he left Capcom, and he formed... And then just only had hits. Yeah, right? it was just constant success after that. Tell me about all these hits. Yep. So uh, he formed his company, Comcept, uh, which mm-hmm. I always... Struggle to say for some reason uh, because, because of that it's M. a normal word that he put the wrong letter in. Exactly. And I hate that. Anyway, uh, so that was founded in December of 2010, and their uh, intent was to design and produce games, but not to develop or program them. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good because those aren't his strong suits anyway. So he's the idea man, and then he has somebody else do the work. Uh, and yes. then the, the following month, he formed Intercept which was a, a, a company that would uh, develop and program games. Uh-huh. So basically the right. things that his first company is not going to do. Let's get into all these very notable games that this legendary designer has worked on. So, uh, and also he started working for a mobile game developer at the same time. Anyway, uh, so Intercept, the programming company, their first project was a game called Kayo King of Pri- Pirates, which was uh, a 3DS game that was supposed to be pirates mixed with uh, uh, Journey to the West. Uh huh. It's weird. I don't feel like I've ever heard about this game. That is weird. So the publisher of the game was uh, Marvelous, and uh-huh. they canceled the game uh, <laughs> three or four years after it was announced, stating uh-huh. that they had lost 461 million yen on the project. Oh, is that all? Yeah. Um, no word as to why it was canceled, just that they lost a lot of money and it's over now. Um, well, surely they have other notable games under their belt. So, uh, they do, they do have some games that they worked on. Uh, they, they worked on, uh, the Hyperdimension Neptunia series. Oh no. Uh, they worked on Soul Sacrifice and oh, no. Yaiba Ninja Gaiden Z. No! Oh, I don't even know what that one is and I know Ninja they Gaiden. They worked on Yaiba? Yeah. It was, uh, I don't... Do you know what that one is? Oh, I remember Yaiba. Okay. You don't remember this no, shit? No, I don't it, remember it was that. So, it was in this like Ninja Gaiden drought. We had the Ninja Gaiden mm-hmm. trilogy come out. Everyone right. was like, first one was amazing. Second one was yeah. pretty good. Third one, still pretty good, but not as good. Right. And then we're all waiting. We're like, what's the next Ninja Gaiden? Mm-hmm. And then they announced Yaiba Ninja Gaiden Z, mm. which might as well have not been called Ninja Gaiden. <laughs> there was a ninja in it. Yeah. Was it Ryu? I don't know. Uh, because I don't think anyone actually bought the game. I think literally zero people bought Yaiba. Because nice. it came out, reviewed terribly. Mm-hmm. It tried to do this extremely stylistic art style thing mm-hmm. that seemed like it would have been a better fit for like a Shinobi revival or something. Right. Um, and it just didn't, it did not land. It reviewed poorly. Oh. And everyone was very disappointed that Ninja Gaiden had a shit game under its belt now. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Well, that was concept. That that was a thing they did. Um, Great. And of course, uh, then in uh, in <laughs> August of 2013, they started a Kickstarter. It for... makes me sad mm-hmm. that w- we have to end the show on this. <laughs> this is the guy that created Onomusha in yeah. Lost Planet, and yeah. we have to end on this. Well, he also reverse designed Mega Man. 
he reverse designed Mega Man. Yeah, so, so I just want to say, but before we get, before we talk about this, we're gonna make a lot of fun of him. Yes, and his shitty, shitty ideas. Right. Inafune is is legendary in the game industry for good True. reason because yes. he has amazing projects under his belt. True. And he deserves that praise. He doesn't yes. deserve to be called the creator of Mega Man because no. he didn't fucking make the thing. Right. But he did uh, spearhead, create, and work on a lot of extremely notable things in the game industry that should be celebrated. Also, he was a longtime contributor to Mega Man, who is yes. uh, definitely responsible for a lot of work in the Mega Man series and a lot of the reason why the Mega Man series continued for as long as it did. Yeah, a and lot of the deserves, longevity of it. Yes, he deserves praise for that as well. All right, now let's talk about my this. Number nine. Yeah, so uh, the, they started the Kickstarter August 2013. It was going to be developed by Concept and public or designed, uh, sorry, designed by Concept, developed by Inti Creates, who had done Mega Man 9 and 10. And it was Mighty Number no. 9, the spiritual mm-hmm. successor to Mega Man. Right. Uh, the campaign started August 31st, 2013. It met its $900,000 target within two days. It was uh-huh. at the time the sixth most successful Kickstarter campaign of all time. It collected a total of three million eight hundred forty-five thousand one hundred seventy dollars in pledges, with an additional two hundred one thousand four hundred nine dollars collected via PayPal uh, as bonus pledges. Now, to put that in context, because mm-hmm. Kickstarter is now used by giant corporations constantly time, that yeah. have massive Kickstarters, but th- this was like. This this was proof of concept to a lot right. of the game industry that right. Kickstarter could work, that it could be yeah. a success. This this yeah, is prior what to this led it was things, indie games at best. Yeah, th- this is what led to things like the Ooh Yeah, yep, uh, and, and and Bloodstained and, 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 and Bloodstained yeah. and other massive video game projects. Th- yeah. This was this was a watershed moment right. in in indie games and in crowdfunding as a right. concept. This oh, yeah. was a big deal. Oh, absolutely. Um, and so, uh, a few months later in February of 2014, Inafune said he wanted to turn Mighty Number no. 9 into a meta franchise, including <laughs> comics and manga and anime and movies and a TV drama series. And I think more. you just call that a franchise. I don't think you need to call it a meta. A meta franchise would be a franchise of franchises. I yeah, think. It's, a, it's a franchise franchise. <laughs> it's a franchise okay. of KFC franchises. You so, get... how, how did development go, Saturn? Um, so they held an additional crowdfunding campaign uh-huh. for another $200,000 in July, 2014 to oh. add English voice acting to the game. Cause that was going to cost an extra $200,000. Um, and then a few months this... later in October, they had a third crowdfunding campaign for $198,000 for a DLC stage. It seems like mm-hmm. they didn't think ahead about what the entire scope of the project was even going to be before they got into it to be doing mm. three Kickstarters for additional little things. But that's weird because they raised four times their original budget. I know. It seems. <laughs> I know it seems strange. <laughs> <laughs> so then they announced an animated series in 2014 that was supposed to release in 2016. Mm hmm. How was it? I don't know. It, it, <laughs> it, I still haven't seen it for some reason. And huh? then the next year in July of 2015, Legendary Pictures announced an agreement with Comcept to make a Mighty Number no. 9 major motion picture. This was amazing. At yeah. the time, uh-huh. people were so fucking hype. Yeah. We everyone we were so high. Mighty number no. nine movie, TV mm-hmm. show, comics, games, crowdfunding, voice acting. Yeah, this was crazy. It was yeah. crazy. So then, in the summer of 2015, uh, Concept launched another Kickstarter for a game called Red Ash, and people this is two years after the Mighty number no. nine Kickstarter. Yeah, and Mighty number no. nine was not released, and people no. were upset because yes. they had already funded a game. And it hasn't been released yet. And what are you doing already trying to get money for a different game when we're still waiting for you to finish this first game? And uh, Inafune actually came out himself later and said, hey, uh, well, the way that game design works is not everybody works on every single second of the project. And the people who did the early design, they're sitting on their thumbs right now because their job is is done. Fair. They need something new to do. 
He's running like a company, not right. like an indie game company. Exactly. In indie game companies, you got four dudes who are living like off of no money for three right. years while they crank out a game. At an actual game company, you don't do you don't right. do it that way. Right. It's inefficient. Yeah. So these people needed a new task, um, and the game did not meet its goal on Kickstarter. Uh, and they announced that it was still going to be produced. It was going to be funded by a Chinese publisher, Fuse, uh, but uh, that was that was canceled. Yeah, so wasn't Red movie. Ash like very much like Mega Man Legend Three? It was. It was very Mega Man Legendsy. Okay. Um, but it, it well supposedly it never released, so we don't know. Uh, but Mighty Number no. Nine was released. It was finally released in June of 2016 after several delays, uh, and it was released to reviews that would make the developers cry like an anime fan on prom night. It was fucking bombed. They yeah. carpet bombed that game. That yeah. thing was just blasted off the face of the earth so i do want to comment on that pre-release trailer that uh that deep silver uh put out a week or two before the game released where they said that uh uh, uh it, it was action so crazy that it would make you cry like an anime fan on prom night or whatever <laughs> because that's there's there's missing your target audience and there's right? drastically missing your target audience. Yeah, and there's directly insulting your target <laughs> right. audience. Yeah, that was a weird choice of of Do you of think do you think videos. they contracted John Romero for those? Or? <laughs> That's the only thing that would make sense to me. <laughs> yeah, that game really made you its bitch. Anime fan on prom night. Yeah. An executive somewhere okayed this. Inafune yeah. was like, that's great. Put that out there. <laughs> no, he actually, in a in a later interview, said that he didn't speak English and he did not understand that trailer. And, oh, and, okay. And when it was translated for him, he was confused as to why that would be released. Right. I assume he would also be confused as to why an anime fan would be crying on prom night. It, it just, <laughs> the whole thing doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, I was an anime fan and I had a great prom night. What are they even Yeah, if you're about? living in Japan. Mm. <laughs> um, so, so they was supposed to have uh, 3DS and Vita ports as part of the Kickstarter. That was part of the uh, campaign. It met a, a stretch goal and they were going to make 3DS and Vita ports. And yep. uh, when the game released, uh, Deep Silver and Comcept said, oh, uh, well, you know, they're going to they're gonna be out next year. Next year. You can play Mighty Number no. Nine in your 3DS and Vita. Well, that that never happened. Um, but uh, the game's credits do list the names of sixty-seven thousand two hundred twenty-six backers from Kickstarter. So the game's ending credits run three hours and forty-seven minutes. <laughs> I played Mighty Number no. Nine. I never got around to finishing it, but if I had, I would definitely have remembered three hours and forty-seven minutes of ending credits. That has to be a record. Yeah, I, that I, has to be a record. There better be a skip button. That's, that's like the original runtime length of Solaris. That has to be a record. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's pretty nuts. Um, but yeah, the uh, the backer rewards for the game still hadn't fully shipped by January of 2017, six months after the game came out. Uh, Fan gamer said that they couldn't ship the rewards as they hadn't received the assets from which to make the rewards from Comcept. <laughs> so, here's the thing. Uh, the one thing? <laughs> Mighty Number no. 9 mm -hmm. definitely sounds like a project that was started and then accidentally run all the way through by the ideas guy. Yeah, basically. Because I get that, because here's the thing, and I feel like people make fun of idea people. Mm -hmm. Idea people are extremely valuable in creative spaces. Oh, yeah. They really are. As a person who has had to, with Saturn and everyone else on staff, come up with 370 episode <laughs> ideas. Right. Coming up with ideas And only stuff. three of them are in 64. And, <laughs> and only two Sunsofts, okay? <laughs> Give us a fucking break! <laughs> Having someone on staff that all they fucking do is just crank out ideas that you can work into something right. is an extremely valuable skill set. Absolutely. Those people should not also be the people tasked with bringing the ideas to fruition. Right. They should not be the program manager. 
they should be the, hey, I think this is a good idea. And then the people that do the doing of things go, that is a good idea. I think I can make something with that. And then yes. it moves on down the production chain. Right. This is how these things work. Right. <laughs> Instead. This was the mistake Inafune made. This and was I among remember... the mistakes. Let's be fair. <laughs> Mighty, Mighty number nine was was so hyped, and it yes. felt like such an abysmal failure. And the thing is, this, its reviews weren't that bad. They were like they five were or mediocre. Six. Yeah, they were mediocre. And I do wonder because it's funny I mentioned John Romero. I do wonder if it was kind of a Daikatana situation yeah. where Daikatana really was wasn't okay. that horrific of a game. It was yeah. okay. I mean, you know, I know people that are like, oh yeah, I like Daikatana. Pablo <laughs> likes Daikatana. It's it's I feel and I'm so. Sorry, Pablo. <laughs> I swear, I remember him being like, I like Daikatana. <laughs> I feel like he's going to be like, what the fuck are you talking about? No, I didn't. I'm going to feel bad. <laughs> I'm like, I for him to like dub in here like, fuck you. I hate Daikatana. <laughs> I'm nobody's bitch. Um, <laughs> but it was this thing where the marketing and the hype was so insane for it because of the way they marketed it that for it to be mediocre right. was more offensive than for it to be bad. Yeah. If Mighty Number no. 9 came out and it was like so fucking bad that we could all laugh at it and have fun anyway. Yeah. I think that would found be an audience. That would be an, an enjoyably bad failure. Right. But for it to come out and just be like, that's really boring. Yeah. The worst thing you can be is boring. Let me just say that. In the creative space, the worst thing you can ever be is boring. Either be great or be fucking terrible. Right. But don't be boring. Yeah, because if you're boring, people hate that more than they hate things that they hate. Yeah, see, and I think, see, I, I you think can, that's what happened. You can be uh, no fart, and that's good. Um, <laughs> or you can be a really loud fart, and that's funny. But if you're a silent fart that smells really bad, nobody wants you. That's <laughs> all I'm saying. So you, so I guess back of the box quote, mighty number nine. <laughs> it's a sad <laughs> fart of a game. Yes, or a silent is, fart of a game. A silent fart of a game. That is that is my review for Mighty Number no. Nine. So, Simon, what happened to Comcept before we get into final thoughts? Uh, so, they were purchased by Level Five, uh -huh. who has since rebranded themselves as Level Five Comcept. Level Five Concept Atari. <laughs> <laughs> Level Five Concept Natsume Atari. Lots Atari, of Atari. Lots of fun. Marvelous. Uh, yes, <laughs> we did it. <laughs> I'm just <laughs> lots of fun. Marvelous sounds like a couple of posh British people. <laughs> lots of fun. Marvelous. Yes. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Mm. Yes. Uh, yes. Right. Uh, uh, marvelous. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, they did appoint uh, Inafune as their chief communications officer, a role he still holds today. So he is still in the video game industry at level five concept. Um, and uh, I, I assume they are still putting out like Professor Layton games and other things that Level 5 does. So, Good for them. Yeah. As far as final thoughts, it, it mm. is said that out of all the awesome things Inafune did, I, you know, uh, uh, because he's, you know, he's, he's, he's almost 60 now. Right. He's getting up there. He's, he's yeah. probably not got a whole ton of extremely notable things left in his repertoire, you know. Right. Um. Of all the massive, notable things he did, I think long term, Mighty Number no. Nine is going to be what people remember. Sadly, yeah, I think that's unfortunately his legacy. Despite all the great things he did earlier in his career, and he's even done some, you know, great things at Concept uh, as as uh, design work for other studios. But uh, unfortunately, when you put your name on that big of a massively hyped um silent fart that's what people remember yeah uh speaking of silent farts uh you can go to our patreon.com slash retro warriors and f listen to talking wizards and after hours and uncut versions how many of this silent show? farts do we have there well you'll never know because it's an audio format uh and you can't you can't we don't have smell vision do you remember smell vision saturn <laughs> yeah yeah definitely i remember there was a uh, Episode of uh, uh, Married with Children that was in smell vision Yeah, and you had to go get the the smell sheets. Yeah, Seven Eleven. Yeah, you, well, I got I got them for home improvement. Mm. I, let me explain for for young people. 
in the 90s, we were trying to figure out new ways to watch TV. Yeah. And we thought, wouldn't it be great if you could smell TV? Right. And then everyone else said, that's a terrible idea. But then everyone said, well, we don't know what else to do because it's the <laughs> 90s and we're bored. Yeah. And, and so they would sell these smell sheets and you would watch the show and there'd be a number that would mm-hmm. tell you which scratch and sniff section of this thing to scratch and then smell to be immersed in the right. experience. Yeah. And these are not the kind of things you can find at our Patreon. <laughs> but, but, but maybe other, they should be. But maybe they should be. Okay. You know, uh, maybe they should be. <laughs> um, I, obviously, we don't have the means to to produce and sell smell vision uh, sheets. So you'd have to make them yourselves. But, if, so but I, if you pledge enough money, we promise we will make them right after they release the 3DS and Vita versions of Mighty Number no. 9. Yeah. As soon as those are out. Yeah. And that's off our plates. We'll have right. we'll have time to do it. <laughs> uh, anyway, we do want to thank the following patrons, starting with F- Free Code Camp Quincy Larson and Elson Raves, a huge Earthbound fan excited to try it for the first time. Uh, Freisgungen, Pablo, play every copyright owned music for ten full seconds. Fart Squad, a podcast about social farting. Our producer guy, uh, Evelyn Belchev. Jason Frednick and his frog Fred. And Joe Frankham. For all the patrons, we want to thank, and we want to thank you for hanging out after the ending music, <laughs> because guys, here again, yeah, you won't. You're a pretty eloquent speaker most of the time until we get to the end of the show, and you suddenly forget how words or sentences work. He's still here. He's like the Kramer of the podcast. <laughs> I mean, rewatching Seinfeld. Anyway, okay. um, uh, uh, thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week, and as always, let, let us, us cling, cling together. together. Hi, welcome to the after party. Guy is still here. Hi, guy. That, that's just crazy, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> How's guy just going? bursts in <laughs> <laughs> slides in the door yeah. justin oh. justin you have to see this i need, I need you to invest in my new business <laughs> what, what was the fucking business like are you gonna make your own pizza pie <laughs> sorry i've been re-watching seinfeld it's still a good show i still like it well, i'm glad like i'm glad you like it yeah, yeah well, i'm glad you're glad that i'm glad that i like it Ooh, we're doing this now Hey, well, guy, you know, what you been up to lately? Yeah, what have you been up to? I got married. A what? You did? I did. To a human? Look. <laughs> 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 let's let's not, you know, put, put walls on this concept, <laughs> sir. I got married at a time and a place recently. Yes. Yeah. yes. And that's Was anyone all there? anybody needs to know. See you next time. No. Is that is <laughs> one time I do want your segment to be like, yeah, no, I'm good. Anyway, see you later. Like, just <laughs> fuck with me, just so I think you're mad at me for like a whole month. <laughs> you know, that's all right. Uh, you'd, ha- you'd have to say it like super dry, though. You'd, you'd like Justin's like, what you been up to? And you're like, nothing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, what okay. you got first this week? Nothing. <laughs> All right. Well, it's your time. So I'm done. It's your time, Justin. <laughs> your time. Our time is now. I, I forfeit my time. <laughs> <laughs> to my In opponent. the interest of our friendship, I'm going to not talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah. How, how, uh, hi. How's hi, the married yeah. life treating you? Uh, pretty great. I've been yeah. married for like a week and a half. Um, nice. And it's it's being married. I don't know. Okay. I don't I don't know if if you guys know this feeling. I I, I assume certainly do not. At least one of you maybe does. But like as soon as you get married, nothing changes, but everything changes. Um, now Justin was pretty drunk through it. I've been married for a lot of years now. I don't really remember what new marriage is like. <laughs> I'm coming up on like eight years now. Right, and I. Like I was married for six years, uh-huh. um, and the first time we got married too, it was like you know we went, we got, we went on this vacation, we got married, and then we came back and we just went back to our regular lives. But it felt different because no. you know whatever uh, commitment, a I legal guess. binding contract now. I mean, right. it's been eight years, and I still call my wife wife. 
That's that's good. Yeah. That's the first. Like, <laughs> no, I mean like at t- I'll be like, hey wife, in, in, in instead of her name. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, I do that because you've forgotten her name, though, right? She. I don't know. I don't- <laughs> I don't like saying people's name, and I never found one. Yeah, me either. Uh, a nickname that stuck with 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 my wife. Yeah. Um. So when we got married, I'm like, I'm just gonna call you wife now, and she goes, Okay. Yeah, that's that's why it's less yeah. to remember. Yeah. All you got to remember. See, it's because it's two things in one, right? Mm-hmm. Previously, I had to remember her name mm-hmm. and her relationship to me. <laughs> now I can just say wife, and it's the one thing. It's one less thing to remember. Right. Now, <laughs> but, can I ask both you guys something? So uh-huh. you're both uh, uh, parents and married, right? Yeah. 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 Um, That's the name of our sitcom, Parents and Married. <laughs> at, at any point, uh, have you either of you started referring to your wife as mom? No. Uh, well, yeah. Well, when my kids were young and my mm-hmm. first wife, yes. Yeah. Because like, when, uh, like go ahead. my parents still call each other either mom or dad or their grandparent names and like i'll go over there and be like you know i i i know who you are you can refer to each other by your own names well, and then they got a head wound and you forgot and they act like it's really weird to call each other by their names um yeah i call my wife mom when my when my kid is around yeah like if my kid's in the room she's mom child. yeah like it, no if i'm just talking to her oh okay uh if my kid's not in the room she's wife Okay. And if she's upset me, then she's Courtney. <laughs> uh, you know, the same way if my daughter has upset me, it's your child. Your child did this. <laughs> Look what your child did. Right. Um, so, yeah. And if it's just the dogs in the room, I call her Ma. <laughs> because that's what the dogs call her when I do the dog voices. Okay. They call her Ma. Oh, yeah. I'm, well, I feel like I'm giving a lot of insight to my personal life. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but no, it was it was a nice little ceremony at the house we're nice. building. Justin was the the efficient, efficient yep. Reverend Justin Baker is my full title. Yeah, yeah, I got a giggle out of that too. It's on the I can, yeah, it's on your marriage certificate. Yeah, it's on the no. marriage certificate, Reverend Justin Baker. <laughs> well, I'm supposed to put my title on it. My title is technically Reverend, so I, I, I you know, because it says in the in the line full title. Yeah. So I don't yeah. want to just put in Mr. and then be like, well, who the fuck is this Mr. guy? <laughs> oh, yeah. Justin I'll, got mad yeah. at me, so he'd never speak to me again at <laughs> our, like, uh, post-wedding lunch. Yeah. Did I? What was I? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You because... yelled at me on the show that nobody listens to, so go ahead. <clears throat> yes, because you, we show up, first of all, first of all, <clears throat> guys like, yeah, we're going to eat at this place that has five kinds of mac and cheese. And I'm like, all right, <clears throat> well. You say a place has five kinds of mac and cheese. I'm imagining like a Fuddruckers kind of vibe. Mm. And we go in and it's really fucking nice. Yeah. Like real nice. And everybody's dressed nice. Mm. And I'm in a Nintendo Power t-shirt and a Reaper Games ball cap (laughs) because it was sweaty because we did the ceremony (laughs) outside. So I changed in the car. Yeah. And the lady's like being weird about it. And I'm like, (laughs) I'll go put my jacket on if you want. I didn't know it was nice. They just said you got a lot of mac and cheese in here. (laughs) It was like a Chili's kind of thing. Nice. And we're sitting there eating lunch Uh for like half an hour, just talking, having a good time. And his son pulls out a Digimon. Mm -hmm. Like you do. And I was like, this is the only time that I would have been able to, uh, in the wild, battle Mm -hmm. Digimons with someone. And you did not inform me that it was going to be here and I could have brought mine. Right. Go ahead. Defend yourself. First off. Anytime you're potentially around my son, which we have a date scheduled in the future, mm-hmm. you can that now was bring the your first Digimon. Time. Well, now I know now. <laughs> but Why? if you had been told before, right. how would it be it, any more of a, a ruined surprise than in the you. future? But also... No, this is on you for not no, no, always I'm having about your the Digimon. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to carry my funny. fucking Digimon to your wedding ceremony. I don't want to be like, hold on, let me put my Digimon down for a nap so I can marry you guys. <laughs> Have you met me? You know I would understand that. <laughs> well, yeah, I just... it yeah, was. I it like was a fun. I would have been cool with that. And like that and, is, and like like Saturn said, and is still waiting on an answer for it. <laughs> if I had told you beforehand, oh yeah, maybe bring your Digimon. My kid has his. It's the same thing. Yeah, it would have been the same thing. 
No, I would have brought it. I would have right. brought it then. Yeah. And then we could have battled Digimons. Right. Okay, but you so why don't you bring it next time. time? Which you said your problem is that you didn't want to know ahead of time. You want it to right. happen organically. Yeah. Well, it just would have been exciting to be like, oh, you have a Digimon and I have a Digimon. And then why we won't it be Digimons. exciting next time? Right. Well, it's going to be slightly less exciting because now it's tempered by the fact that Guy has withheld the fact that his son is raising Digimon. And I did not know that. Okay. But now you do. Now he I got do. a Digimon for Christmas. I told you he got a Digimon for Christmas. I only remember that just now. <laughs> uh huh. Right. <laughs> it seems like it was, that's still your problem from his it uncle was Pablo. The, it was the um. It was the second wedding I've officiated, mm -hmm. and the first one where there was an actual ceremony. The last one they just mailed me the shit, and I was like, <laughs> all right. Uh, and my mom got married, didn't say anything to anybody, and did not ask me to officiate. I was pissed oh. off. Oh. And so, yeah, I got, to, I got to officiate Guy's wedding. It was fun. It was nice. a nice ceremony. Yeah, we, I had got ride, to, we got pictures. I had to write, up the, had to write yeah. up the script yeah. for the thing, which yeah. I had never done, hmm. which is weird. I've, uh, I've done two weddings now, and I had to write up both of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's weird. Well, also, it was outside, too, so like mm. I didn't want to have like a fucking speech in there. Right. And be like, now nah, while we're all sweating our balls off, <laughs> let me tell you about the, these people that we all know. <laughs> Love is a many a splendid thing. <laughs> Marriage. <laughs> but it was fun. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited for the uh, reception in October. Yeah, October. we got your RSVP today. Nice. Yes, I. The reason I hadn't sent it is because I wanted Courtney to fill it out because my handwriting is abysmal. I kept <laughs> to ask her. How bad was my handwriting? Yeah. How bad was Saturn's handwriting? I don't know. It's, I, I saw Saturn. It worked. Cool. <laughs> then that was good enough. Well, you made, there were such cute little RSVP things that I like. I wanted to, I wanted, I didn't want to send it back all uglified <laughs> with my gross handwriting. I, one time, <laughs> one of my very close friends to me saw my handwriting for the first time, very close friend of mine, uh -huh. and goes, You have the handwriting of a serial killer. <laughs> That's what he said to me. And was, I was like, was it was Andrew? It Courtney? No, it's not. <laughs> we're not friends anymore. He, he broke okay. up with me. Presumably because he thinks I murder people. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I, I'm imagining you're the kind of person that whenever you do receive something that you have to, to uh, write out, you pull out your, uh, your electric typewriter and you just feed in the paper into it <laughs> so you can type things out. There with one go. finger held up. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> with your pinky out. Yeah. No, I, 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 yeah. I was like, what does that even mean? He's like, I don't know. It just looks like that's a letter that like someone would get from a serial killer. Wow. It's like, I'm going to do they, it again. Did you cut it out of a bunch of magazines? I don't know. I no. I mean, it was just writing. We, we were, that's we were weird. programming and I was writing notes and he was like, oh my God, is that how you write? I was like, yes. That's so weird. Yeah. It's quite weird. What else you got for us, guy? <laughs> Uh, that story wasn't enough. What? No, it wasn't enough. <laughs> I got married. Marriage is not enough. good enough for you. Thanks. That's not pretty good. good I thought. No. I don't know. The whole idea of marriage is still exciting to me. So, you know, I, th I, I think know. it's interesting. Yeah. I don't know. I never thought I'd get married again, but yeah. you know. Nice. Yeah. Well, congrats, I, I, man. I, I, Thank you. I've known divorced people before that they're like, they, they, it's not that their divorces were so bad or their marriage was so bad, but they're just like, I did it once. I don't know that I want to do it again. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, like you put a lot of like investment into it, so right. for it to not yeah. work out for whatever reason is is sure devastating. I guess is the right word. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is the correct word for, <laughs> for a divorce. Most divorces are some kind of devastating. So to be in a position to put yourself, you know, potentially through that again, like at the end of the day, every marriage is going to end sad, right? Or you're right. the dead one. Like, yes, yeah. it's, it's sad for someone, no matter what. Right. <laughs> This is the uh, saddest I, uh, thought I've had in weeks. <laughs> I, uh, Every marriage oh, no, ends a, sad. A... Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah. No, no, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Not if you both die at the exact same moment. Right. That's we're still sad to... for everyone else. No. That well, yeah, but it's count. not sad for you or them. Oh, okay. My matter. bad. I didn't realize that the rest of us don't count in the world, do you guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. What? <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, like you, it, it, no, there's a ahead. there's a dude in my uh, office who uh, almost every conversation I have with him, he says, "Are you married?" And I say, "No." And he says, "Good, don't ever get married. It's fucking horrible." That guy needs to get a divorce, right? That guy's and he's a honest, 
he's on his third marriage. And I'm, and I'm like, well, why did you get married the third time if the first two were so terrible? And he's like, I don't fucking know. I was just bored of looking at the wall all the time. So, you know, I, I paid for this girl to come over here from, from Ukraine. I don't, I don't f- fuck getting married. I'm like, you, I, should, you should get divorced. I love that his alternative to being in a hateful <laughs> marriage uh-huh. is staring at the wall. Right. You can at least masturbate, dude. I don't fucking Seriously. know, man. There's a lot of things you could do. Yeah. Take up fucking tennis. Right? I don't go for a jog. I don't know, man. You know, yeah. watch some TV. Shit. My, my wife complains about me playing Grand Theft Auto all the time. You tried not playing Grand Theft Auto all the time? I don't know. No. <laughs> so I, I love that he was like, okay, well, now all I'm doing is staring at the wall. I'll get married. Well, now all I want to do is play Grand Theft Auto. <laughs> Shit. I didn't realize that before I got married. I could have just played Grand Theft Auto instead of getting married. Like you can't. Right? You know what I mean? Like, you can't do those nice. two things at the same time. Guy, thanks for being the producer on the show. <laughs> You're welcome. Your wife is a lovely person. She is. I'm glad I got to officiate your marriage. And tell her congratulations as well. Yes, I will. Please. Uh, anyway, we'll see you next week. Good night. Bye. Bye.